Okay. Um, good evening. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so very much for coming here tonight. And uh, um, I very much look forward, I was looking forward to this event for a number of months, and here we are finally. Let me begin by uh, acknowledging uh, the people of the Kulin Nations, uh, their elders, uh, past and present, and uh, future leaders that are emerging from that community. My name is Latko Skirbis. I'm a senior Pro Vice Chancellor Academic at Monash University, and I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting this, this uh, lecture uh, tonight. Um, and uh, may I also acknowledge uh, the presence of different constituencies. Um, so there are, of course, colleagues from Monash University. There are colleagues from other institutions. I know there are, there are international guests here. There are FutureLearn colleagues, uh, FutureLearn partners, um, and, and many others. So can I just say thank you very much for coming here today and for participating and contributing to discussion following this lecture by um, Simon Nelson, Chief Executive of uh, FutureLearn, Monash University partner. So um, delighted as I am here today to welcome you all. I would also like to say that the topic of tonight's conversation is one that fills me with excitement as well as anxiety. The topic that Simon is going to talk about is really about the future of learning. And I think this is something that really uh, preoccupies many of us, all of us indeed, and it is something that should preoccupy us if we are serious about education in the contemporary era. As you know, there are lots of reasons why this topic is so current, so hot, and why we should be engaging in this conversation. Uh, given the multiple disruptions that are occurring um, in the world of economy, uh, in political life, in social life, it is really, and, and the way in which these disruptions are actually impacting on the, the, the world of, of, of work, the world of professions, and so on and so forth. I think it is really important for us to consider what is the impact of these multiple disruptions for learning, for teaching, what it means for uh, universities, and indeed what it means for business models that most traditional universities uh, follow and have been following for a long time. What it means for um, collaboration with industry and what it means for collaboration between higher education providers and others who have interest in the world of learning, but also simultaneously in the world of, of work, um, in questions of social justice, prosperity, equity, and so on and so forth. So it is my absolute pleasure tonight to um, welcome Simon to us. Simon is a, is a is young at heart, but old friend of Monash University. So it is really wonderful to um, have you here on campus as well as, as well as your colleagues. And we very much look forward to what you are going to say about the future of the future of learning. Um, as uh, you can see, we uh, spared no, we, we put a lot of effort into ensuring that we are aligning with FutureLearn corporate colors. There are, uh, there are purple roses in this bouquet, so that's all for you. Um, but on a serious note, I would like to acknowledge the great contribution that uh, Simon has been making to the field of digital and online education over a number of years. And I would like to acknowledge the importance that Future Learn is actually playing in this space of, of digital disruption and, 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 and creative approaches to, to learning. So Simon has a background in disru digital disruption and is a pioneer in taking media brands and content online. Uh, he spent 14 years at the BBC, uh, where he was instrumental in putting uh, radio, then television, online. Now, he has received a number of really important and significant awards, and I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, Simon. Startup of the Year at the 2014 British Interactive Media Awards, uh, Best User Experience at the 
2015 uh, UX-UK Awards, uh, Free Digital Content Open Educational Resources Award winner um, in 2017, and earlier this year, another award, FutureLearn won the uh, EdTech, EdTech X Global All Starts Growth Award. And I'm sure this is not the final, the final list, uh, uh, but nevertheless, it really demonstrates the significant impact that, that Simon and FutureLearn have had on the world of, of digital learning. And uh, so it is a real pleasure to have them here. If you measure the success of, of disruptors and, and, and companies like FutureLearn, um, it is probably worth paying attention to some of the figures and the number of, of, learning, uh, of learners that they engage in their enterprise. Uh, they have more than 8.5 8 million learners and over 150 uh, academic partners across the globe. Um, Simon Visit, in fact, coincides with another uh, event that is going to occur tomorrow and the day after, and it is, uh, of course, the Asia-Pacific um, Partners Forum uh, that we are very pleased to be hosting in, in the city. Now, FutureLearn is an evolving platform, and this is really one thing that we need to, that we need to acknowledge. And this does not, this characterization doesn't befit only FutureLearn, but also others who are, who are actually actively engaging, engaging in, that, in this space. Um, it has moved quite quickly and very creatively from being a MOOC provider to being something quite more than that, and Simon is definitely going to enlighten us on, on this topic today. Um, we at Monash University have been a partner of, of FutureLearn uh, for five years. In fact, we were the first international partner and, uh, and we launched our first two courses in the middle of 2014 and we've launched 20, 20 more since. Uh, we have nearly 700,000 learners that have joined our courses and and uh, taking Monash really um, towards an unprecedented uh, global audience. And really that is a feature and characteristic of, of modern, modern learning. Now, um, uh, we are evolving our partnership with FutureLearn as much as we are evolving our partnership with other, other, other uh, partners uh, that are helping us deliver, deliver on our educational value proposition. So tonight is about the future of education and that future is currently being shaped as we speak. And for that reason, I'm really delighted and pleased to have Simon here tonight. And I very much look forward to what you have to say, Simon. Simon will speak for about 40 minutes or so and then we will have an opportunity to engage in the conversation with him. So over to you, Simon. Thank you, Zlatko. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here, a uh, great honor. Uh, and I'll try and make sure that uh, in the course of the uh, talk, I, um, I turn around and, uh, and try and engage all of you without getting too dizzy. Um, so um, this speech uh, is about the future of learning. Uh, and uh, it's particularly intimidating to have to speak to a room uh, full of academics and experts in this topic. Um, but I guess the problem is of my own making, as I did call the company FutureLearn. I suppose I therefore am expected to talk about the future of learning. But believe me, that name could have been far worse. So it's coming up for six years now since Martin Bean, now Vice-Chancellor of RMIT in Melbourne, but then Vice-Chancellor of the British Open University, first said the word MOOC to me. Uh, and a few days later that I agreed to set up a startup for him as an initially British response to the MOOC movement sweeping across higher education. So MOOCs, for those who don't know, are massive open online courses uh, and bring together communities of learners uh, from all over the world to learn from the world's top educators. Now, we had to launch the company a few weeks later. Martin Bean likes a deadline, for those of you who know him. Uh, and we were scrabbling around trying to find a name for the company. 
and we kicked around some cracking names. Inspired You, Alta Ed, Colonel, Delve. Uh, but luckily, we stumbled across FutureLearn, barely believing our luck that it was still available, and FutureLearn.com was available. And so as a result, I was able to be CEO of something other than Delve. But that still presents me with the problem of having to give you some insights into the future of learning. Something so potentially important, and yet so potentially unknowable. Now before I get started, I'll give you a spoiler. Uh, in my view, the future of learning is online. The transition is inevitable. The industry is going to undergo fundamental change that won't stop. Indeed, I believe learning has been undergoing that change for many years now. I think it's accelerating, and I think we can barely begin to grasp the significance of what's happening. And as in other sectors, this is going to represent transformative change for learners and fundamental change for the incumbent industry players, the universities. And when thinking about the impact of the internet, uh, I always go back to a phrase first told me by John Norton, uh, observer columnist, that the best any of us can hope to gain when trying to understand the internet is a sense of informed bewilderment. And to quote him, we're informed because we're intensely curious about what's going on. We're not short of information about it, but it's too big a question with too many variables, and we're too early in the cycle to really understand how it will impact. In the same way that people in the 15th century had no real concept of what Gutenberg had created with the invention of printing by movable type. Now, I certainly often feel bewildered, and though I do my best to be informed, in developing this talk, I thought I'd best fall back on what I certainly do know. The experience I do have, and the opinions I've formed over now 20 years leading digital teams in the BBC and now at FutureLearn. I've worked with and led some very smart digital pioneers and have now probably talked to hundreds of universities all over the world about their perceptions of where digital's going. The company I run, FutureLearn, not Delve, has signed up approaching 9 million people to over 1,000 courses and has generated a massive data and research that I can also tap into. And I've, of course, had a front row seat to watch the development of MOOCs, their highs and their lows. Now, the history of MOOCs provides a cautionary tale of how overhyping the short-term potential of digital change can alienate and provoke the very people you need to bring with you. When we launched FutureLearn, it was at the end of what the New York Times called the year of the MOOC, and something of which its columnist Thomas Friedman said, nothing has more potential to lift more people out of poverty by providing them an affordable education. Sebastian Thrun, the eminently quotable founder of Udacity, claimed that there'd only be 10, years, 10 universities left in 50 years' time, and surprise, surprise, Udacity had a shot at being one of them. Rapidly, faced with this kind of hype, you inevitably saw a backlash against MOOCs. At least in the media and in talks like these, Gartner's hype curve was rolled out with a depressing lack of originality, and I became very familiar with these predictions that we were just a passing fad. And I and my founding team, some of whom had also come from the BBC, some from other tech startups, watched this with some amusement, but also frustration. Because we'd seen it firsthand when the BBC was facing digital disruption. First in radio, where digital predicted the end of radio. And then even more so in TV, when digital was going to sweep away chat TV channels, sweep away the BBC, sweep away whole genres of content. How this cycle of overhyping the short-term impact of digital, if you don't change, you'll die, um, merely served to fuel the doubt of the skeptics who correctly dismiss these ideas as nonsense. But both sides, in their polar debates, 
were failing to engage with the real and exciting opportunities as well as the genuine threats that digital actually represented and failed to look at the bigger picture and take that longer term perspective that maybe reveals more of the real potential. So in education, MOOCs were never the issue. And those who overhyped the impact were as guilty of the, as those who continued to dismiss them. They were just one manifestation of the wider impact of the internet on education. <clears throat> the number of MOOCs, the number of universities offering them, have continued to grow, as has a huge number of, of people using them. And they've moved beyond that early experimentation to now being used for a whole variety of much more strategic purposes by universities. Attracting new students, using them for blended learning, to disseminate and conduct research in new ways, to deliver professional development or high quality learning experiences direct to the refugee camps, disaster zones, and most in need communities around the world. And the thing I've heard most often from the universities we work with at FutureLearn is that the key value of MOOCs has been as acting as a catalyst for wider digital transformation of the university. That early experimentation driving wider change in the way the university teaches and helping them to start to develop the new skills that digital requires in that organisation. But the key word there is a catalyst, the spark that creates the wider reaction. And it's pouring fuel on that spark that I want to focus on in the rest of this speech. How can we build on the start we've made to really deliver on some of that early rhetoric and genuinely be able to say that we've done something to transform access to education, which is FutureLearn's real purpose and the thing that fires us all who work in FutureLearn. Because let's face it, the global mismatch between the supply of and demand for high quality education has not exactly been solved. The demand for higher education is growing and it's not being met. A new global middle class is emerging and seeking higher education. We've been working with Parthenon EY to understand the scale and nature of this vast demand. And they identify that tertiary enrollment rates have been rising rapidly in many countries. And that demand for higher and adult education is going to continue to grow for the foreseeable future. As GDP per capita grows in emerging economies, they identify an inflection point around the five to $20,000 mark, where enrollment in tertiary education rapidly increases to around 30 or 40%. They forecast global tertiary enrollments to grow steeply at around 5% per annum, with Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa growing fastest, leading to nearly 14 million new students per year from now until 2030. Now that's going to require around 13 new universities to be built every week, 700 each year, each serving 20,000 students, if they were all to be educated face to face. That's not going to happen. Now of course I'm aware of and constantly find myself battling the arguments about the relative worth of online education versus face to face campus based teaching. But I've only so much patience with those arguments. We've absolutely no choice but to innovate in finding new ways to scale the supply of education. Otherwise, we either shut out these people who are desperate to learn and are prepared to invest significant amounts of their new relative wealth, or more likely, new entrants are going to fill the gap, possibly with services that are not as good as could be offered by the current HE sector, and possibly some that are better. And it's not just developing economies that are going to see a major increase in demand. It's just about every developed and developing society in which there are huge skills gaps, vast demand for teachers, nurses, engineers, and digital skills, driven by the mass adoption of digital services like these, and creating both new jobs and skills gaps in the provision and management of these services. 
New jobs have sprung up in the last 15 years that would have puzzled us all a, a while ago. App developer, when the iPhone's just over 10 years old. Social media manager, big data analyst, cloud computing specialist. And all these trends are going to continue. Now it's demand for driverless cars, drone technicians, machine learning, AI specialists, creating new in-demand roles that require new skills. And something that traditional education is struggling to keep pace with, with its normal cycle of curriculum development. It's not just IT specialists or data scientists who need digital skills anymore. We've got to embed digital literacy throughout society, at school, university, in the workplace, so that people are experienced with the technologies they're going to encounter and able to adapt to using future workplace technologies we don't even know about yet. And all the latest hype is around artificial intelligence and automation. And you've all seen the headlines with seemingly apocalyptic messages of like how half of all current work activities could be automated using technology that already exists. And by 2030, anywhere from 75 to 375 million workers worldwide, depending on your source, are predicted to be being displaced from their old jobs and requiring retraining. The skills that might protect them or ones it'll take the machines longer to replicate if they ever can, are those essentially human skills of emotional intelligence, creativity, resilience, conflict resolution, and leadership that form the bedrock of the best a university uh, can develop in its learners. A friend and former colleague of mine at the BBC, Azim Azar, editor of the Excellent Exponential View blog, wrote last week that the definition of these skills as soft in some way erroneously identifies them as somehow easier than traditional hard skills. When resolving a conflict, motivating a team, persuading someone to do what they don't want to do, or being able to interpret and use gut instinct alongside data, these things are really hard. He proposes a rebrand of them to power skills something that encapsulates both what the skills give you and what it takes to master them. All of these factors are driving people to need to reskill and change jobs throughout their lives and are bringing that phrase lifelong learning back into fashion. The governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, uh, gave a speech recently in which he said, the biggest issue we may have is how to institutionalize retraining in mid-career and integrate it with the social welfare system. And he goes on to say that the time for a quaternary system of education founded on the same principle of universality as primary, secondary and tertiary education may eventually arrive in the UK. And I'd go beyond his focus on mid-career learners and also look to older retired members of society who've grabbed hold of the opportunities that MOOC platforms like ours are providing them with to pick up learning again for personal development, to maintain mental agility and potentially thereby stave off or delay dementia, or to tackle loneliness by, for instance, learning a new language with people all over the world, and thereby contributing to society through the new skills they develop as well as the experiences they share with the new breed of learners with whom they interact. At FutureLearn, we're seeing this demand firsthand. We've analyzed our massive learner data and grouped all of our learners into archetypes. Uh, our people who are advancing their careers, preparing for a life change, exploring further career or study options, looking to flourish in different areas of life, address new problems, challenges and opportunities at different life stages, taking on those new challenges and trying new hobbies. In short, serving these people has got to be the greatest opportunity ever facing universities to rethink their audience, the domestic and international markets they operate in, their relationships with government and employers, and their role as the hub of the knowledge economy. 
And the tool that enables universities to grasp this opportunity is, of course, digital. Now, we've seen in so many other industries now how digitization removes geographic boundaries, opens up unprecedented distribution to any part of the world, introduces flexible, on-demand, 24-7 services, floods our lives with rich media content and connections to vast stores of information. It uses our personal data to transform the level of personalization and sophistication of the services we use. And while connecting us through the social web in ways that have changed society fundamentally in a few short years. And of course, this has been far from benign. And again, we face that sense of bewilderment as we start to understand the impact that misuse of these tools can have for society. Not something I have time to dwell on in this speech, however. Now, amazing as it may seem for someone so youthful looking, I have 20 years perspective now on the media industry's digital transformation. Uh, it being 20 years since I was head of strategy for BBC Radio. When the CD was still less than a decade old as the big revolution sweeping through the industry and the first signs of digital were starting to emerge. Now I was digging around some old presentations uh, I used to use to try and get people in the BBC and the rest of the radio industry to understand the iPod. It was high tech. There you go. Uh, how you could download your entire music collection to one device that you could then take anywhere. And how things like on-demand consumption and downloading might transform radio and what we were offering our listeners. Now, if I look back at how, as a music and radio lover, my audio consumption has been changed in those 20 years, it feels truly staggering and almost entirely positive. I have access to millions of tracks, mixes, podcasts, radio shows on one mobile device. I've created and shared with my friends hundreds of playlists that have even enabled me to fulfill a childhood dream to be a DJ, albeit about 30 years later than it might have been cool. And that's something I would never have felt was possible if I was having to navigate a box of records. Yes, I miss listening to whole albums. I just don't do it anymore. And I worry about the artists being squeezed out of the industry by the fact that someone like me now pays so much less for those few subscriptions and downloads than I ever did buying records and CDs. But my feeling about digital and that transformation is overwhelmingly positive. Would I go back to the good old days? No chance. If I consider then my TV viewing, my shopping, my banking, the takeaways I order, the taxis I use, the photos I take, the way I read books, the news, the sport I follow, my overwhelming feeling is of radical transformational improvement. And yes, I fritter away hours on social media and fear the impact it has on my children. But it's enabled me to reconnect with and build relationships with dozens of friends and thousands of connections that I feel make my life far richer, including some old friends in the audience. Frankly, I've been trying to shake off for a few years, but um, they found out I was coming. Um, I also feel little nostalgia uh, for the industry players who've disappeared as their sectors have been engulfed by digital. Many of these incumbents thought their industry was different, that their products and services couldn't be commoditized and transformed in the way they'd seen the MP3 shake up music. Many of them were wrong. Maybe not all as wrong as this guy, CEO of Palm. PC guys are not just gonna walk into the phone industry. Now at the BBC, many people felt like this. But a few enlightened and very well-informed senior leaders felt differently and provided those of us leading digital teams with the resources and the remit from the very top to get on with building the digital BBC. They put digital first at a time when other players saw it as 
just part of the IT department. It helped that we had the resources and the business model. We didn't have to make money, and people who didn't pay for the BBC went to prison. But it enabled us to experiment and try out lots of things and find the things that would stick among the many heroic failures. We learned by trial and error that the most important thing was to do the basics right first before you could really innovate on the foundations that you then built. So first and foremost was to make our content accessible. We had probably the world's best content, but it was locked in broadcast schedules, only available to consume once and then gone forever for many people. Online was a phenomenal way to open it up to more people, transforming the flexibility with where, when and how people could consume it on demand, on mobiles, in the bedroom, in the bathroom, in the car. It wasn't about technology and IT, it was about rights clearances, it was about policy approvals and all the internal persuasions of getting the people whose empires felt threatened by this to adopt these new opportunities. And there was no point just putting it out there if no one knew about or could find it. We had to make it discoverable, creating new, well-designed online products like the BBC iPlayer that could aggregate that content and present it in new ways, as well as syndicating our brands and content into the environments where our audiences were now spending time, into YouTube, into the iTunes podcast store, and critically making sure that there was world-class metadata around all of our content, new skills for the BBC, to make it visible on those platforms and via search. We had to embrace social to stay relevant in these new digital environments, in tune with the changed expectations of our audiences who wanted a more active engagement with their media. Initially, that was email and SMS. Then it became Facebook and Twitter. And it was only once we had these foundations in place that we were really able to start enhancing our core offerings with websites, interactive features, and create the entirely new radio, TV, and online services that vastly expanded our ability to uh, serve audiences. And that was the sexy stuff and where everyone wanted to focus first. But the key to making it sustainable was to work with and try and enable not work against or try and disrupt the core radio and TV operations. Create multi-platform producers out of the radio and TV producers. That was a real heavy lifting and many of us still bear the scars of years of trying to drive that cultural, technical uh, and political change. But as a result of this, not only have we made sure our content was all out there in these environments, we ended up building one of the world's best, most visited and most trusted content websites, bbc.co.uk, and the UK's leading on-demand service, the iPlayer, and genuinely made the broadcast BBC into a digital brand. And we'd helped to transform the organisation from within. But it was really hard work. It took all of those 20 years, and they've only just, they, they still haven't finished. Because even though they survived and thrived the first arrival of digital, the threats are now probably even bigger. One thing that must really send a chill down the spines of the current leadership is how the tech giants like Amazon or Google and a myriad of con new content players like Netflix have successfully moved beyond just di distributing content into being able to create TV, film of the highest quality. In Australia, you all love the royal family, I know that. Um, so watch The Queen on Netflix, and you'll marvel at how brilliantly Netflix can now create the type of programming the BBC thought only it could do. Now, the BBC is going to respond again to this kind of thing. Last week, for example, they announced millions of pounds to go into original podcasts. And they partner with many of these new providers. But digital disruption doesn't and never will stop, and nor does the imperative for them to keep transforming themselves. Now, in education, the possibilities of digital are no less transformational for the end user. 
vast stores of new learning content and courses, many of them free from the world's top universities, access for those professional and older learners and people in countries who could never have dreamt of studying courses from a place like this, never mind come here physically to attend those lectures. Flexibility to do this learning wherever and whether, whenever they want, on their phones, on their TVs, via their smart speakers, on the bus, in the bedroom, in the bath. Learning that's way more fun, enjoyable, interactive, connected to the web, rich in media, immersive, augmented. Data-driven services that use machine learning and AI to adapt your learning style. Social interaction that makes learning less lonely, enabling you to interact and learn together with people in Peru, Portugal or Perth. And the qualifications that learning can generate, rethought and built around the learner, their needs and those of the employers they're looking to work for. And all of this potentially way more affordable to the mass audiences who are driving that huge demand. But we're not there yet. When I look at my learning, and more pointedly that which my three teenage kids are going through, I feel significantly less inspired by the changes that have taken place over the last 20 years in education. So why is it? Well, we think it's partly about what universities can do, but a lot of it's about other industry players and other platforms. Now, when we started FutureLearn, we were already 18 months behind uh, our competitors, two years behind by the time we launched our platform. And Martin Bean said to me, or said to the press, uh, the memorable quote, we may be late to the party, but we're gonna be the best dancers. Now, those of you who've seen, seen me dance. Um, but our assessment as a launch team, when we came to look at the market, was that most online learning platforms simply didn't do the basics well. So maybe we could dance after all. Platforms were poor and inaccessible. They didn't work on mobiles. They felt like they were designed in the 90s for the educators, administrators, or regulators, not actually for the learners. Many of them had very sophisticated pedagogic features, but learning experiences that felt about as much fun as filling in your tax return. And believe me, filling in your tax returns got a hell of a lot easier in 20 years, if not much more enjoyable. Courses felt like people were just trying to lift and shift lectures out of more traditional lecture halls than this, um, and accompany them with tests. They were too long, they were time to match traditional university timescales, often leading to the inevitable mass attrition. And this is still often true. No amount of machine learning or adaptive algorithm can disguise the fact that many still provide a shoddy learning experience, way out of kilter with what people now expect other services in their lives. At FutureLearn, we tried to focus on doing the basics brilliantly. We felt that the proposition had to be accessible on mobile devices from the outset. And indeed, now nearly 50% of learning on our platform across MOOCs, CPD and degrees happens on mobile devices, 50%. We face lots of opposition on this from academics who were worried that the online features they were used to wouldn't work on a mobile. But it just didn't feel like an option to us. I watch horrified as my kids binge watch entire TV series or an epic IMAX worthy film on a mobile phone. But they and everyone else is doing this. And if we want to learning to be part of their digital lives, we've got to be on that device. We also made sure our platform and therefore the learner experience was beautifully designed. That your learning felt like the kind of service that belonged alongside those other digital services in your life. It's not a nice to have. In online learning, you don't need many excuses to give up and go and do something easier instead. And we wanted to be replacing not their traditional learning time, but their media and entertainment time. We wanted to compete with Twitter and YouTube, not Moodle or Blackboard. We worked to make ourselves discoverable using SEO, social marketing, making content shareable, 
developing a strong brand, and ensuring that we and our partners' content was findable in search engines. And we encouraged our partners to create enjoyable courses, a controversial phrase for some, but one that we always continue to emphasize with our partners, and encouraging them to tell stories, use engaging narratives in courses, and ensure that they're creating well-designed learning experiences, not just trying to replicate the classroom online. And our owner, the Open University, near 50-year veterans of distance and online learning, helped us identify social learning as the key thing we were going to innovate around, focusing on what we felt was really exciting about MOOCs, not just pumping video over the web, but connecting thousands of learners and enabling them to learn from each other and connect with new communities. Adapting the conversational learning approaches developed by Diana Lorillard. Now we feel vindicated in this approach in that around 50% of learners in FutureLearn courses engage in our social activities. The quality of that communication is consistently the highest standard and those people are six times more likely to complete the course than those who don't. And as a result, our completion rates have been industry leading. And we've worked with, rather than trying to disrupt universities, working with innovative partners like Deakin uh, or Monash in the audience today, who've helped us move beyond MOOCs, with Deakin to delivering full degrees, with innovative approaches to unbundling the degree, our Russian doll model, into smart, smaller courses and micro-credentials that target and support the professional learner to find, start and progress to the qualifications they need. And increasingly we're working with employers to understand and help them deliver against their own changing requirements. Research we recently published found that nearly three quarters of employers believe evidence of online learning is a valuable asset when considering the promotion of an existing employee. The same number believe it to differentiate candidates you're recruiting with similar qualifications. 65% believe a mix of online and offline to be the best option for employees to learn. And around 80% are willing to provide funding for their staff to take courses. So we're really proud of what we've achieved so far. We've helped people pass interviews, win promotions, get new jobs, improve their English, pass the IELTS test, learn new languages, get into university and top up their study skills to succeed when they get there. And in the last two years alone, 800,000 people have studied mental health courses with us. 113,000 have learned about cancer. 71,000 about dementia. A million people have taken courses to improve their teaching. 32,000 from non-OECD countries have studied for a free certificate from a UK university as a result of a UK government funded initiative, Study UK. We've reached healthcare workers in West African Ebola treatment set camps, 40% of whom took our course on a single phone. We supported Bangladeshi doctors working in refugee camps with our course on eliminating trachoma. We delivered basic skills to learners in Syrian refugee camps. And as Lee wrote to us, we're transforming access to education for many whose disabilities have excluded them from traditional education throughout their lives. So this is real impact on real people and changing lives in ways which would never have been possible with traditional education. But it still barely scratches the surface of what we want to deliver if our real ambition is to transform access. And it doesn't yet deliver on the potential we know there is for digital learning. So we're looking to significantly expand our own efforts. We've got lots of work to do on this platform, make it more accessible in other languages, improve distribution all over the world, make our courses available offline in low bandwidth, improve awareness of this offer. Most people still don't know what amazing services they can get on, courses, on platforms like ours. We want to be visible in app stores, uh, visible on the mobile screens, uh, develop and market uh, our brand and those of our partners all around the world. 
We want to help our partners create, get better and better at creating courses, retaining learners on them, and starting to use data in far more exciting and interesting ways to help them uh, keep and provide effective learning to their learner base. And we're going to continue to innovate in the use of social learning at scale to provide new forms of supported peer-to-peer -peer learning to enable massive cohorts of learners to succeed on short courses and enhance the experience for the smaller cohorts who are taking online degrees through more sophisticated and enjoyable group work. And we want to support our partners to improve quality, target new markets, innovate commercially and generate new revenues. And if we can do that, then maybe we can help to drive down the costs of this education for those people in the world who just can't afford what we're putting out at the moment. So our ambition is to be the best online platform in the world to study online, whether a short course, a micro-credential or a degree, while helping to really transform access. But we're not going to get anywhere near achieving that unless we have partners who share our level of ambition. So how are universities doing? So the successes I've spoken of have all been driven by our partners. We have over 150 of them from all parts of the globe, including nearly 100 of the world's top universities. And many of our biggest successes have come from right here in Melbourne. Monash were our first international partner five years ago, almost to the day. Uh, and we now have four partners in Melbourne alone. Uh, and 10 across Australia. And there does seem to be a different spirit in this part of the world uh, that's built on a sort of longer culture of distance learning, the fierce, though, obviously always friendly rivalry uh, between uh, so many top universities, and, of course, the proximity of the vast opportunities in Asia. But just contrast this with what's happening in the rest of the world. I read with some incredulity the results of a survey of international vice-chancellors run in the Times Higher Education magazine recently. A bit depressing, if not really a surprise. So when asked whether online degrees would be more popular than physical degrees by 2030, over 50% of vice-chancellors in the Europe and the US disagreed, as opposed to only 20% in Australia. In Australia, your university leaders consistently agreed with statements like online degrees will be more popular, degrees will be shorter, the average age of the cohort will be higher by 2030. You're way out of kilter with your colleagues in Europe. A quarter of European VCs even disagree with this statement. Established and prestigious universities will be offering full degrees online by 2030. Really? So they're going to leave it to everyone else to tackle that vast demand gap that exists in higher education. So they must be more relaxed about the future than I am. But was Sebastian, but Sebastian Thrun right? And are these guys the next blockbusters, Sears, Robux, Kodaks? Now, there's no doubt in my mind that in 12 years' time, demand to spend three years studying in the dreaming spires of Oxford or to be taught face-to-face -face by world-leading academics in the most prestigious universities in the world is going to be huge. People will pay a huge amount of money for that. And most of the universities, if not all, are still going to be there offering these services. But what worries me is that in the process, they might have become even more elite. And, they, and that the vast opportunity they've got now to have a major global impact will have been handed over to other new incumbents. You know, let's face it, do have the means as they did in media, to crack new modes of education. Every tech giant in the US and China is looking at education. It's starting to invest huge sums in it. And I want the universities that we work with to have their own houses in order, to have transformed themselves so they can be powerful collaborators rather than weaker competitors with these new players. So. How do we do that? So I'll relate back to what I learned at the BBC and what I've learned when dealing with the most forward-thinking universities. And I don't want to appear craven, but they're largely in Australia. 
In short, you need to rethink the university as a digital brand and an online campus. You need to rethink your target customers, welcoming the international, professional, retired, disadvantaged learners alongside the core younger students that are also demanding improved digital services to enable them to learn more flexibly and dynamically. Rethink your relationships with all of them. They're no longer just your students while they study their formal qualifications with you. Keep a lifelong relationship with them as digital alumni, topping up their qualifications with professionally focused short courses and credentials throughout their professional life and beyond. Invest in the heavy lifting of technology, copyright, to make yourselves accessible on multiple devices. And make sure it's not just your crown jewels. Potentially everything, in my view, that a university offers has a place online. Every academic team should be thinking about how they can improve the reach, impact and effectiveness of their teaching, from ancient history to particle physics through digital. You've got to make your brands, your content discoverable through international partnerships and distribution, but get your own digital houses in order as well, transforming what are often pretty poor university websites, the marketing, the CRM and recruitment services you have in-house, and how you use metadata to improve your performance in search. Do continue to experiment with new forms of teaching, but don't get too obsessed with the latest interactive feature, immersive game or adaptive technology, without valuing and prioritizing an outstanding learning experience. Get the basics right. Then invest in high quality, enjoyable online courses that are designed for the web, not just lecture capture. And the campus experience, use social, which we think represents an amazing opportunity to take what everyone says is the best thing about a, un a campus-based university experience. The friendships, the connections, the social uh, connections you make. Social web enables you to scale that to an international community. Online doesn't do away with a sense of community, it can take it up several levels. And you need the new skills that your digital teams are importing and developing within the university. Learning design, online content production, product development and design. Support and invest in these people. I don't know a single one of our partners where the teams we deal with wouldn't say that they're overstretched and struggling to cope with demand. Give them a real mandate from the top and be prepared to back them and learn from the inevitable failures and missteps that, they'll ke that will come along the way. And give them the floor in the university to help transform the rest of your people, the really hard bit. As with the BBC, this is going to take time, it'll never stop, and it's no guarantee of protection against a new entrance who'll be voraciously trying to take your place in the digital marketplace. But as with the BBC, you have so much to offer if you can unlock it, so many strengths to build on, and that mandate to deliver social as well as commercial impact. And one last thing, the key to both individual success and getting closer to the collective prize of transforming access is partnership and collaboration. So of course, continue to uh, partner with platforms like us, not to outsource what you're doing, but to help build and support that internal capacity with world-class experts in product development, learning design. And we will continue to foster collaboration within our partnership, bringing partners together in events like the one we'll be holding at Monash over the next couple of days, sharing insights, data, uh, and research. But what we also want to see is much deeper collaboration and partnerships between universities. And we think if you can start to collaborate on building, co-creating, recognizing each other's courses, then we could all move faster to the bigger aim. And I'm delighted to announce today that Coventry University in the UK and Deakin University here in Melbourne are partnering to offer a new postgraduate degree in entrepreneurship on the FutureLearn platform. 
And we're very proud to work with trailblazing universities like these to be playing a part in new collaborations, which we think is a big step forward for the industry. So the future of learning is rife with potential, and everything I've outlined today is about opportunities, not just threats. And every single institution has a right to be excited, not scared by or dismissive of digital. Only through education can society rise to the challenges it's facing. And we can't afford to let education remain behind the walls of unaffordability and inaccessibility. So let's accelerate the industry's digital transformation and let's be its leading players. It's hard, it's political, it's controversial, it takes bold moves. It involves ongoing and unsettling change for everyone in a university. And it takes years. But let's build on the start we've made and let's do it together. Because only then why might we be able to really start to fulfill some of that early rhetoric about transforming access to education. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Simon, for your, for your uh, thoughtful presentation and for raising a number of challenges that, uh, that preoccupy us and should preoccupy us. Now, this is an opportunity also for colleagues here in the audience to ask questions and, and, um, and uh, really investigate some of the challenges that you've raised, opportunities, I should say, <laughs> uh, further. May I also acknowledge something that I haven't done earlier, and that is that uh, we, are, um, we, are, uh, we have a global audience. Uh, we are transmitting directly to Monash, uh, Monash Malaysia, and so greetings to our colleagues there. But over to your audience. Uh, any questions for Simon? Okay. Thank, thank you for your speech. Um, you, talked about using, you talked about using social to enhance the campus-based experience. Um, you might be surprised to hear that uh, some of my students in the Monash Business School find flirting in campus coffee shops more interesting than <laughs> statistics or accounting lectures. Right. Yes, I'm sorry. I to find that you. staggering to understand, especially in, a, in this university, but okay. Um, well, we, well, indeed. How, how can you... I, well, replicate isn't not, the right word. Not flirting. But, 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 how, but how can you allow students, particularly undergraduate students, who are different, obviously, to the post-experience ones, how can you get that? How can you deliver that sort of experience to undergraduate students? Because most of that growth you were talking about, I think, was in undergrads, wasn't it? So um, I, I think the key is not not to think about replicating what's happening here. It's about reinventing it in an online environment and. The online environment is an inherently social environment for these people. So I think there are all sorts of ways that one can not only encourage a um, uh, communication and interaction between students all over the world as they learn together, but also embed that in their learning. So actually to get them learning together in groups, doing projects together, and using the kind of social learning principles that we've embedded in our platform. And I guess the key is that I'm not saying that that's going to be as good as sitting in you know, this fantastic campus drinking the best coffee in the world, but we have no choice if we're going to tackle this challenge and make it as good as we possibly can, but to try and innovate in scaling this type of service all over the world. And social is something the web does really, really well. So our philosophy is let's bring it into learning and let's use it as a tool to increase effectiveness. Hi, Simon. Hi. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Helen from RMIT. Um, can we do swipe right for an academic? <laughs> um, but um, my question actually with your great uh, focus on access globally is what you're thinking around pricing strategies in that context when there's very different uh, economic situations and how we increase access when you're looking at Africa and West Asia and so on. So... Um, 
so we've got to do something about it because you know if we're pricing uh, at the same price we're pricing in uh, our local markets then we are going to be shutting out uh, these audiences so uh, i'm not saying we have found a solution yet i'm just trying to put in front of all of us that if we want to tackle it then we've got to try and find ways of scaling up education scaling up the potential revenues to enable the driving down of cost uh, to potentially introduce uh, targeted pricing in different locations. It's the kind of thing we could be uh, working through. Uh, and to bring governments and employers together with us to enable us potentially to subsidize that education in key markets. So it's a radically different thing, but at the moment, as I said, we've offered tens of thousands of people in non-OECD countries the opportunity to gain a certificate worth 50 pounds from a UK university. Uh, sponsored by the UK government. I want to find ways of bringing the people who can afford uh, to subsidise these things alongside us in these partnerships to enable us to tackle these challenges, but also to help all of you innovate in the way that you build, deliver and price these courses and help you deliver success in terms of real scale. I think it's the only way we're going to tackle it. There's no magic wand, however. I think it may be time. Oh, no, there's another one. Sorry. Thank you, Simon. Um, you talked about employers wanting to offer courses now. Um, and so how can you see universities maybe leveraging that relationship better? Uh, so I, I think that um, you know, universities and employers have already always worked uh, Together, it's not always been the most harmonious of relationships. Um, and I think, you know, you, anyone in the sector will be familiar with, you know, the various research that comes out that says that, you know, industry leaders don't think that universities prepare their graduates for the world of work, um, for example. Um, now, there's all sorts of uh, innovation that we've seen going on with companies coming in and helping to identify what jobs are available, what skills those jobs need, start to package that together for universities to help them to understand where the demand is in the market, and then hopefully incentivize and encourage them to create courses that are more targeted towards them. And the kind of things we're doing as well is to try and encourage uh, and enable uh, employers to much more easily facilitate uh, paying for the learning, and make that learning more bite-sized, flexible, something that ha can happen alongside work rather than forcing the employee to take a plane, take a train, sit in a hotel room, take time out of their work life in order to study. So vast increases in flexibility, better use of data to connect what employers need in universities. May I... I'm Han Ching Kiu from Nankai University in Hello, China. Hi, good, afternoon. Uh, good evening, Simon. Thank you for such an interesting and fascinating speech. Every time listening to you, I get inspired. <laughs> anyway, so I've been, you have been in Hong Kong, I've seen you in Madrid, and anyway, <laughs> so I followed you. <laughs> I guess the question I'm trying to ask is that what is your view about the future degree offering? I understand you mentioned it briefly there's a collaborative work among universities offering a full degree. I believe that is at the master level? Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a uh, grad, sir, uh, initially. Postgrad degree, Post degree <laughs> yes. um, initially, yeah. So, now there's some kind of talking about the micro bachelors, micro credentials yep. around the world, starting from edX, and now they were recently in China in Tsinghua University attend their meetings. So we are also in the process from Nankai thinking moving to that direction. So I would very much like to hear from you. What is your view on that? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, our, our view is this is a very exciting development. It's a natural development of the market. Um, so lots of players came in offering short courses. Uh, then some of us migrated to offering full master's degrees, but where partners like Deakin and Coventry, our first degree partners, took us was to encourage us to unbundle and break down a full master's degree into those short courses, but then package them back up into credentials 
that we believe have much uh, credibility for employers uh, and where someone could just learn that micro-credential on its own and that might be all they need at this stage. However, what we want to do is try and bring within our partnership some consistency in the way that all of our partners develop those credentials. Now, if they do that, that potentially means they can start to stack each other's credentials and thereby create new qualifications out of it. And it's this kind of approach that Deacon and Coventry are pioneering uh, and we're very excited to be part of and the platform underpinning it. So we think, and they think, I think, this is how you start to massively expand international cooperation and potentially try and help us all drive cost out and improve quality of some of the qualifications that we're offering to the world. So it's a very, very exciting development and expect to see uh, some uh, exciting uh, moves from us. Thank you so very much. Now, uh, I, I, as we just heard, you keep popping up in Barcelona, <laughs> in Hong Kong, and so on. And I'm so glad that you popped up here in Melbourne. Um, can I just, as a, as, a, as, as, a, as a final question, perhaps, ask you about um, the impact that the transformation you're talking about is having on the key constituencies that you are dealing with? Uh, uh, in particular, I'm wondering about uh, what, in your view, is the impact of transformation that you're talking about on academics themselves? Because in many ways, they are profoundly impacted by these changes. And indeed, in many cases, they are resisting um, these, uh, these changes. So would you just give us a brief set of reflections on that? Sure. So, um, yeah, the, the MOOC movement, and we were no different, started with... Um, a coalition often of the most willing academics. So in all of our partners, it was often the people who put their hands up first, uh, who were most enthused that led our first courses. Um, and what we found is almost without exception, in the hundreds of courses we have run, those academics have said to us afterwards, that it was one of the best, most significant teaching experiences they've ever had. Teaching large international cohorts Engaging with those cohorts on, in social uh, environments uh, has in it given them skills to take back into the classroom and rethink the way that they're teaching uh, their core services. Now, it was kind of the same at the BBC. It was always, you know, the, the, the most technically advanced who wanted to build their first websites. And it's a fantastic way of lighting the fuse within an organization because other people start to watch and they start to see the plaudits coming to those people and they start to see them boasting about the thousands of learners they've got. They start to see them winning awards. They start to see them getting attention and resources within the university and it spreads. So we know there's lots of academics who are you know, very nervous about this uh, and think that their particular brand of teaching you know, wouldn't stretch to this environment and I just would encourage all of you to you know, be patient, continue to you know, drive uh, to show them through experience how much progress we're making in improving the quality of online education. And inevitably, in my view, this change is going to come and it's before they know it, those last stalwarts will be looking around and the market will have moved on. So I'm, as you know, a, a, a huge... Uh, evangelists and enthusiasts for what's going to happen um, and uh, yeah I think we're just at the start um, and uh, it's going to be a very exciting few years. Thank you so, so very much and uh, please join me in thanking Simon for his, uh, Thank his you. excellent presentation. <clears throat> Now it is only fitting that we um, we uh, present you with a with a token of appreciation. But can I just say one of the things that that you mentioned earlier is rings so true to to many of us, and that is that we have no choice but to innovate. Uh, one of the things that I would like to acknowledge is that uh, platforms, companies, collaboration networks such as Future Learn and what FutureLearn represents is really becoming a central piece of, 
of international global connected infrastructure for learning. And I very much uh, look forward to not only seeing how Future Learn is going to evolve its partnerships and its ambition in, into the future and how partners are going to grow along the line, uh, along, alongside, but also I think it is upon us, all of us who are contributing to these networks, to actually do our bit to innovate and to think forward about the opportunities that this disruption actually represents. So please thank me again in, in, thanking, in thanking Simon, please join me again in thanking Simon for his excellent presentation and a small token of appreciation. It's very us. kind. Thank you, Zlatko. And I, I really appreciate uh, Monash uh, hosting this event, uh, giving us this wonderful space to, uh, uh, to share in and uh, hosting the uh, FutureLearn Partner Forum over the next few days. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, Thank you so very you. much, Simon. And so please join us now uh, uh, to, uh, and enjoy some drinks and nibbles with us. Thank you so very much and thank you for joining us.